Biomechanics of Fractures and Fixation. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Michael Kane, and I'm Sakib Vermont narrating, and this is our fourth and final video from this slide deck. We've talked about basic biomechanics. We've talked about biomechanics of fractures. Uh, we've talked about biomechanics of bone healing, and uh, we started to also discuss um, uh, principles of uh, or fixation constructs, and we started off talking about basic uh, principles and then external fixation. And now we're going to pick up with intramedullary nails, talks about, uh, talk also about uh, plates and screws, and um, then we'll wrap up. So intramedullary nails can be a load-sharing implant. Modern nails are hollow, which make them a little bit lighter, um, and uh, but they're still relatively strong in uh, bending, and uh, the stiffness is proportional to the fourth power, as we talked about with cylindrical implants. Um, so stiff, a st stiffness of a nail depends on its material properties. Uh, the fixation construct stiffness depends on the location of the fracture. Uh, there are other things we can do with intramedullary nails to affect the mechanics, interlocking screws. Um, we can also sometimes do blocking screws, and we'll talk about more this in a, in a different video on intramedullary nailing, but when you do blocking screws, that sort of prevents uh, a rod from um, sort of toggling inside the bone uh, at, for instance, the metaphyseal level, sort of blocks the rod into place a little bit, narrows the uh, diaphysis, uh, the, the canal, essentially. Um, so... Um, what about plate and screw fixation? Well, there's many different types of screws. There's cortical screws, there are cancellous screws, cannulated screws, locking screws, uh, and then there are conventional plates that um, don't have locking screws, and then there are locking plates, and sometimes you can do both conventional and locking screws with some of these plates. But you usually can't do locking screws with a conventional plate that has no option to lock the screws. So let's talk about the anatomy of a screw, right? I mean, you have the screw head, uh, of course, which is where you engage the screw. There's thread height, which is that uh, sort of distance in capital Z shown there, which is between sort of your core and the outer uh, perimeter of your, of your uh, screw threads. Uh, there is the um, core diameter, or X, um, which is what you would drill your pilot hole, for example. Uh, there's the outer diameter thread, which is Y, okay? And that is, uh, if you were to drill a gliding hole, uh, let's say that's what the diameter would be. Uh, that's, you know, where your screw is trying to get purchase, hopefully, if you, if you don't do a gliding hole. Uh, and then there is the pitch, um, or sort of di that distance between the um, threads. And that varies depending on the type of screw you're using. So for example, a cortical screw has a smaller pitch, smaller thread height. Cancellous screws have a larger pitch, larger thread height, smaller core diameter. Um, cannulated screws, like shown here, have a wide core diameter um, to help them be better in bending. Uh, and they have a decreased pitch uh, and a little bit uh, lower pullout strength. So screws um, uh, generate torque. Uh, they can compress bone if you are doing lag screws, either by design or by techniques. So by, de by design means that the screw itself, for instance, may be partially threaded and uh, is allows itself to do um, compression as opposed to technique means you have to do an overdrill and pilot hole and uh, sort of create the opportunity for the bone to compress with the screw you're using. Uh, screws also help to compress a plate to bone if you're using standard Cortex screws, uh, and uh, or I should say non-locked screws. And um, if, if screws are locked into a plate, uh, you can go bicortical to disperse forces, and that can be very stiff. So... Um, if you are doing plate techniques, there are different plating techniques. So, you know, there's no such thing as a, as a neutralizing plate in terms of, you, you can't turn to your scrub tech and say, give me the neutralization plate or give me the buttress plate. Um, whatever plate you're choosing can be 
utilized to function as a buttress plate. So these are diff these are essentially plate functions. A plate can function in compression if you choose to make it do that. It can be a neutralizing plate that you've done a lag screw and now you're just protecting your lag screw against rotational forces. You can do buttress plating for uh, uh, preventing shear and anti-glide is a similar concept. And, uh, you know, the plate, the, in, in, you know, in these contexts, it relies on friction between the plate and the bone. Um, it's an example of uh, in distal radius. So um, plates bending stiffness is um, affected by their thickness of the plate to the third power. So if you have, for instance, a lot of small fragment plates um, like that go with 3.5 millimeter screws, for example, you can often bend them using handheld benders. Um, whereas um, a four or five plate, you almost have to, you have to use like a tabletop, huge bending press type device just to get it to bend if you need to bend the plate. Um, so if you have fracture gaps, these are bad because not only do they prevent primary bone healing, but they can allow for fatigue failure. So having that bone contact really improves your stability. And this is a, an example of that. Like when you don't have bone contact and you leave a gap, um, that reduces your stability immediately. Uh, and you know, you're off to the races, uh, against bone healing and, um, you know, if you have healing, it'll prevent fatigue failure, but if you don't get healing fast enough, this can fatigue. So we said that screws can compress a plate to bone, as shown here, right? So if you use standard cortical screw, and let's say that your plate is contoured perfectly to how that bone should be, well, then this is a great indirect way to sort of use those screws to help the plate um, reduce the, help to reduce the fracture for you, and that's a, that's a reduction technique, for example. We also talked about how you can do compression. So if you have an oval hole in a plate uh, and you place that screw all the way at the one side of the oval hole, as the screw seats itself, uh, it will the screw will need to move into the center of the hole. And as it does that, what happens is, well, the plate has to go in the opposite direction as is shown here. And uh, that essentially forms um, or well, allows the fracture to compress. So somewhat of an extreme example shown here, but this is essentially the principle uh, for when we uh, do compression plating. Now, when you use locked plating, you can see here uh, the plate is not compressed down to bone. You have many fixed angle points of fixation, so these screws are not going to toggle. And you can almost call it an internal external fixator. Uh, it does not rely on fraction. You can see that plate is not compressed down to the bone. And um, it's fixed angle, so uh, it can't not gap. And um, we talked about this earlier that you have to make sure if you're doing hybrid type fixation and you're using both cortical and locking screws, you always got to do your cortical screws first. If you are trying to achieve some type of friction uh, and then your locking screws, which you can often use just for example, if you have osteoporotic bone. So when you put a, when you use conventional screws in a conventional uh, design as shown here, uh, you compress the plate to the bone. The bone is pre-stressed. The periosteum gets crushed as well. As opposed to lock plating, um, the plate, not the bone, is pre-stressed, and the periosteum, you can see, is preserved. Now, um, I, I mentioned you can do hybrid screw fixation. We're using both locked and unlocked screws. Um, many locked plates happen to also be pre-contoured for you, uh, which is great. Uh, and helps in a lot of circumstances. Uh, we already talked about this sort of lag before locking. Uh, and do not lock in a gap, right? So if you have a big gap, it's a recipe for a non-union. So that concept of hybrid fixation in this context means you're using locked and non-locked screws. Um, and uh, we kind of talked about this already. So in summary, um, going back to the first video in this slide deck, it's a balance between biology and mechanics. We focus, focus a lot about mechanics here, but obviously you're going to have to use this in the context of the, the soft tissue envelope, the patient characteristics, the biology, and in general, the more in, you know the, the more stiffness, for example, with plates and screws that you want to provide, it's more disruptive to the biology, it's less biologically friendly to achieve that. 
So there is a little bit of this inverse relationship where if we want to be very, very hands-off and allow the biology to proceed undisrupted, it's sometimes harder to achieve stability in those cases. So geometry and material matter um, affect stiffness of the construct. Um, load transfers based on vectors and lever arms we talked about back uh, in the earlier videos. Uh, we talked about avoiding shear and promoting compression when you can. Uh, we talked quite a bit about lagging or putting cortical screws in prior to locking screws when you're using a locked plate. Um, we talked about managing stiffness based on types of bone healing. Uh, we talked about minimizing stress risers, maximizing working length. And uh, here are some uh, references for you. And this stuff is covered very well in some of the basic uh, textbooks like Rockwood and Green. Thank you.